Galatians 4. I'm going to read through. I'm just going to read one verse. Galatians 4, verse 6. Galatians 4, verse 6. Do you ever want a chance to turn there? I always like to read in context, so I'll back it up to verse 4, Galatians uh, chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. This is it, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I think that verse, chapter 4, verse 6, sums up so well what, if I had to say anything about the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do? How does he relate to us? Chapter 4, verse 6. If you are sons, because, because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit is who connects us to God. So let me, I'm going to mute a couple of channels, having a little bit of feedback coming through. So if, you, if I mute you, it's not personal. Okay. So uh, if I were to talk to you about what does it mean whenever we talk about the Holy Spirit, who or what are we referring to? And what does it mean? How, how would we describe the Holy Spirit's working? I wonder what you would say. A lot of times, uh, and, and it, some of it's influenced by our, our perception in the media, or we might hear about, you know, Pentecostal Christians who, you know, have a very fiery spiritual experience, we might say, uh, and there have been moments that have even made the press of big things, like maybe back in the 90s, of the Toronto Blessing, and just it's what seems like an outbreak of the Spirit, uh, this new act of Pentecost. We just, and again, we, we see this, is that people who pray that miracles would happen, and they do happen. Uh, I think often I hear it most often whenever we talk in two ways. One, whenever people say, I think the Spirit is leading me to do something, and I affirm that this, we need to seek the Spirit's leading in all things. Uh, so that's one. The other is in the worship, right? We we have a, a powerful Sunday, and whatever, whatever that means, right? Um, I felt the Spirit was moving today. I was joking with Jonathan before we started tonight, and I said sometimes it's whenever that chord hits and we hear that the drums and the voice sit at all at one time and you know we have to be careful because it, sometimes we confuse our emotions or this powerful intuitional feeling we have with the spirits working and i don't ever want to discount those but i don't want it to just be those i want us to have a bigger scope so let's how do we include that in our definition uh, not just our definition but what the bible teaches to us so we're going through the Apostles' Creed, and we're getting to the line now, the third article, which is that third paragraph, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And at first it might seem that the Spirit's given short shrift in this creed here, because uh, if you look at the rest of it, God the Father gets two lines, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, go on for ten lines. He has ten individual statements. Uh, about him and then we get to the holy spirit i believe in the holy spirit move on i believe in the holy catholic church the communion of saints forgiveness of sin forgiveness of sins resurrection of the body and the life everlasting uh even the original version of the nicene creed which i think is another important creed for us to know the original version that which, which was drafted in 325 it said and you know had this long article about god and really long one about Jesus, and then it just said, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, period, end of the creed. That's, that's all it said, you know, after having this long line. And so we still have to figure out, I, the reason I want us to go deeper than these words is because it leaves things unsaid, like I mentioned earlier. Who or what is the Spirit? I think that's a, I think that's a very important question. Uh, is the Spirit merely the power of God and acted for us as if it was just a force? Or is the Spirit more than that? Just a brief church history lesson. This became really important in the 300s AD, this discussion, because for
for so long they've been debating who Jesus is. Like there would be people, you know, that, you know, we're getting to this definition of Jesus as fully God and fully human. But, you know, they had people had different gradations than they. Well, maybe he's fully God, but only kind of human. Or maybe he's fully human and just kind of inspired by God. Maybe he was a human who had the mind of God come in, and that's when he had this God consciousness. Or maybe at his baptism, he really became God's son at that point. And again, there were all these things, and they were dealing with answering that. Again, and we know he was fully God, fully man, has dealt with God in eternity past. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You have to really stand on that. And it was kind of in the wake of that, you had people say, you know, well, what about the Holy Spirit? And, and I think, honestly, the reason it, that wasn't as controversial is because if you look in your Bibles, the Holy Spirit is on not just page one, but verse two. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the water. So the Spirit is pretty active, and we, we see him a lot, but... One of the big things that came up is, do we treat the Spirit with the same equality as the Father and the Son? Uh, you all know my son's middle name is Basil, and I, because I, I, I don't, not to tell people this, not because I really like to put basil on my food, although that's true. <laughs> it's because there's a church father I really admire named Basil of Caesarea, Basil the Great, some people call him, and he and one of his buddies named Gregory, they really helped lock this down and kind of warded off attempts from people who tried to reduce the spirit to a force. And they really uh, wanted to say more about him. So the Nicene Creed actually had a revision one time in 381. It didn't change what was said. It just added to what was said to bring clarity to this main point. And I actually printed the, the, the what it says uh, here in, on, the, on the thing. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. Again, the Bible teaches all of these things. It's adding more language, not, not changing. It's important that we realize the Holy Spirit is a person, mm -hmm. not a force. It's a who, not an it. It's weird if we, sometimes we say the Spirit is He, I guess. You know, we know God doesn't have a gender. The Spirit, even in the Greek, is a new, they have neutral, neutral uh, or neuter verb, uh, pronouns there. So, uh, you know, He, uh, I know one theologian who uses she to refer to the Spirit. I don't necessarily feel comfortable doing that, but I understand why. He's just trying to say there's, there's not really a gender there. Right? We call the Father and the Son, so why don't we, you know, share the gender? I just think, you know, it's a, it's a who, not an it. That's the most important thing we, we, we need to say in terms of what pronoun do we use there but the holy spirit is involved in every point of god's action from creation as we mentioned a moment ago in genesis 1 all the way through our redemption into the end uh, there is the the patriarch of the greek orthodox church of antioch said this and i think this is man this is important without the holy spirit god is distant christ is in the past the gospel is a dead letter the church is simply an organization. Authority is domination. Mission is propaganda. Worship is the summoning of spirits. And Christian action is the morality of slaves. I think that's right. If we don't have the spirit, then we lose it all. It kind of all untangles without the spirit's work. So what I want us to do now is to just kind of dive in, see what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. First, we're going to talk about what it just what does it mean for the Holy Spirit to be God. We're not going to do a full explication of the Holy Trinity tonight, but... That is what it's related to. And then we'll talk after that about some key things that we see the Holy Spirit do in the Bible, not just in the New Testament, really throughout the entire Bible as it relates to our Christian life. So I mentioned this already. The Holy Spirit is present even on the opening pages of the Bible. Uh, the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. And this is important because, again, it, if the Spirit is involved in creation, it means the Spirit was not created. Right, we, the, the Spirit proceeds forth from the Father and the Son. And we can say that all things have their origin in God the Father, are created by the Son. That's what Colossians 1 says. All things were made through Him and for Him. And we can say they're completed in the Holy Spirit. We might even say that about our salvation. God sent His Son to earth to die upon the cross and to rise again from the dead. And now the Holy Spirit is sent to us. 
We could think of the resurrection from the dead. Jesus died upon the cross, but Romans chapter 8 says that the Spirit is the one who raised Jesus up from the dead. So, again, the Spirit is involved in completing our redemption. This, it's a part of God's very life. And spirits are something that the Bible just assumes. It doesn't teach us about spirits because it assumes that spirits are existing. That just means cre creature, or not necessarily creatures, but beings that don't have bodies, okay? Uh, we believe, we, we talked about this a couple years ago in our Bible study, we believe in spiritual beings, angels and demons that we can't necessarily see with our eyes, but are working in God's universe and God's creation. As we go through the Old Testament, again, the spirit is all over the place. Key leaders are filled with the Spirit. Um, and Joseph, whenever Joseph is in prison, you remember he was, you know, falsely accused in prison, and then they found out that he could interpret dreams. And it was because the Holy Spirit enabled him to do that. Exodus 35, actually, one of the first times people it's mentioned someone is filled with the Spirit. It's the artisans, the, the leaders of the craftsmen who build the tabernacle. So <coughs> There are these two guys, I forget their names, it's like Bezalel and Aholibab, I think are their names. And they are, um, in Exodus 35, they are filled with God's Spirit as they construct the tabernacle. And again, that's important because the tabernacle is the place that God dwells. So it's not just any old building. We don't just need to go find an architect and a contractor to build this thing up. God's Spirit was involved in constructing the place where God would dwell with his people. In Numbers chapter 11, Moses takes 70 elders up to the mountain and the Spirit falls upon them, and they start prophesying. That's the thing that happens. And there are two other people in the camp who start prophesying. Someone comes to Moses and almost tattles. Moses, 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 don't you know? They weren't with you, but they're prophesying too. And, and what Moses says is, would that all God's people would prophesy. Were, were that they were all filled with the Spirit, that they could be prophets, enabling them to lead, prophesy, and make sound judgments. Judges and kings are filled with the Spirit. This is one thing, if you read through the book of Judges, again, we have leaders who are very um, either mixed or bad. There's a couple good leaders, a couple mixed leaders, and a couple of bad leaders in Judges. But we're often, we're often said that they are filled with the Spirit before they do something. They, the Spirit rushed upon them, and then they did this thing. That's even said of King Saul. Right? There's a big moment in King Saul's ministry where like the Spirit departs from him, you're not, this isn't to say that King Saul went, went to hell. It's just to say that the blessing of the Spirit that he had, enabling him to lead his king, left. And uh, it's because of his disobedience and hard-heartedness. And it's something that is a part of the new covenant. It's prophesied what happened, uh, that God would give it to his people. Ezekiel 36 is just this beautiful place where uh, not only does God promise that he would give his people a new heart, but he says, and I will put a new spirit within them. I'll give them the heart of flesh that they might live. Joel 2, as we, we've seen Joel before, but it's that famous passage that Peter preaches on on the day of Pentecost. All right, the Spirit will fall upon the people, and their, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. So in short, what we might say, as everywhere that God is working, the Spirit is, just where the Spirit is, God is. That's a simple way we can say that. God, The Spirit is kind of God. It, it, he is God's active power in the world, but not as a force, but as a person who carries this out. And when, in the ministry of Jesus, we see this. I've mentioned this already. Think about his conception, right? You will, um, Gabriel, what does he say to Mary? You will uh, receive child when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will conceive a son. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Whenever Jesus is baptized, the Spirit descends upon Jesus like a dove. And, and we're told in the Gospel of Luke that whenever he performs miracles, he does it because of the power of the Spirit within him. And that, again, it's not to say that, well, was he weak without the Spirit? I think it's more to see that whenever, the, whenever Jesus is doing something, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always working together. Right? The works of God are unified. And then he promises his disciples that he would send them the Holy Spirit, which he does, which he does uh, on the day of Pentecost. And so the Spirit brings God's presence and Christ's power to us. And uh, one day, again, that's one of the ways we can be certain that the Spirit is a person and not a force. There's two things. One, of how Jesus, the great commission that we receive from Jesus, go ye therefore into all the world, making disciples of all nations, teaching them all I've commanded you, and baptizing them, in the name of who? Of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
there are some traditions that do free baptisms. You kind of you go and not you know when I baptize Austin on Sunday, I said that and then I put him down one time. But sometimes they do it in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And then again, there's, I'm not saying that's one way is right or wrong, but that's because we emphasize it's uh, God, the Holy Trinity, who we who saves us, who whom we worship. And the Spirit performs things. This is, I remember I had this light bulb moment at the seminary one time. I was reading this guy named Gregory of Nazianzus. That's the town, the little podunk town that he was a pastor of, a great theologian. And he has this thing on the Holy Spirit, and he's like, listen, y'all are, some of y'all are saying the Spirit's not a person, he's a force, but can a force be grieved? Can a force help and encourage? No, a, pe- a person does that. It's a, it's a, it's a person, not... A force can a can a spirit groan, or sorry, can a force groan before God? No, a, a person does, and the Romans eight says that that the Holy Spirit helps us, intercedes for us, and groans with us with longings that are too deep for words. In Acts chapter five, you know the remember um, I forget their names, Sapphira and Ananias and Sapphira. Okay. I was like, it's not Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila. Like, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, Ananias, okay. That's right, that's right. Uh, same book. Uh, and, and, there's, and there's another Ananias that comes three chapters later, so it, you know, it's kind of confusing. But in Acts chapter 5, whenever Ananias and Sapphira lie, Paul said, or Peter says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. So again, you can't lie to a force, but you can lie to a person. And so, uh, and, and the Holy Spirit uh, speaks with us the spirit and the bride say come revelation 22 verse 17 so uh the holy spirit's a person and sometimes people say of the holy spirit that the holy spirit is the forgotten god the forgotten person of the trinity or maybe baptist i've heard this said before baptist the baptist trinity is father son and holy scripture and i think that lands somewhere but i think that that is a little overstated because i think part of the role of the spirit is to bring glory to the son and to the father Right? We have to understand, again, that all the works of God are united. They don't, they're not separated. So whenever we come unto Jesus, we realize that it's the Holy Spirit who brought us there to begin with. And whenever uh, we know the Son, we can know the Father. Uh, again, he, he's called the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. That was the other passage I wanted to read earlier. Romans 8, verse 9. I'll, I'll turn there quickly and read it for you. Romans 8 is just a, one of the most amazing chapters in all of the Bible, but it says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So, again, I just, I think, I think part of the role of the Holy Spirit, if we were to not give Him the glory He deserves, we should glorify Him with the Son. He's worshiped and glorified, but but I think it's because he's trying to get us to Jesus. I think that's the point. The, the, our Lord, who became a human like us and who died for us, that's the one around whom all of creation uh, is centered. And the Spirit's not created, but he brings us to the Son. So uh, I think that's just important to know. So the Holy Spirit uh, is a part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, a part of the Godhead. So how is the Spirit involved in our salvation? Well, again, we mentioned he was involved in the life of Jesus, the Spirit who rose Jesus up from the dead, as Romans 8, 11 says. But also we believe that the Holy Spirit gives us new life. John chapter 3, one thing you should know about the Spirit is in in, in Hebrew and in Greek, there's a word play always on spirit and wind, or spirit and breath. Those are, it's always, it's most often the same word that can be used for either thing. And in John chapter 3, you know, whenever uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, you know, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, you know, say what? (laughs) What do you mean? And he says, the spirit blows where it will. He's in this fulfillment of uh, Ezekiel 36. We have to have the spirit give us new life. All who repent of their sins and are baptized, we're told, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2 and the Sermon on Pentecost. That's what Peter says. And again, I mentioned Galatians 4, 6 earlier. Because you're sons of God, God has sent His Spirit into our hearts, the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, allowing us to cry, Abba, Father. We can know the Father because of the Spirit. Romans 5, 5 says that by the Holy Spirit, God's love is poured into our hearts. And that's how we are able to know God. 
Titus 3, verses 4 and 5 states that, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of works done in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So that regeneration, that's the word that we use, that, you know, maybe uh, it's not just theologians, it's here in the Bible, we use to talk about the new life that we're given, right? Uh we were to go to the graveyard today, if we were to take Bible study up to Spring Hill Cemetery, you know, I could say, y'all get up. All y'all in the graves, get up. Come on. I wouldn't do a whole lot. But the Holy Spirit is the one who can give life. My words can't give life, but the Spirit gives life. If my words have any role in giving someone life, it's only because the Spirit <laughs> is working through them. Spiritual life, new life. So that's one thing that the Spirit does, is, is involved in our salvation. He takes up a boat. He takes up a He boat. dwells in our hearts, yeah. I don't, I don't actually like it when we use language that says, Jesus lives in my heart. I've accepted him into my heart. Because the Bible never uses that kind of language. Not, you know, uh, many of you might like the hymn, He Lives, right? And I love most of that song until we get to the very end of the chorus. You ask me now, I know He lives. He lives within my heart. I like it for two reasons. One, because... We, he lives because he wasn't in the tomb, right? Uh, he bodily is at the right hand of the Father. But second, it's because the Spirit is in who dwells in our heart. Uh, whenever I'm ch counseling people to believe on Jesus Christ for their salvation, I, I typically use language like that. Right? Call upon the name of Jesus to be saved. I don't typically say invite him into your heart because it's not the language the Bible uses. It's not to say that if that's the prayer you pray, you pray that you're not a Christian. That's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, we're saved by faith in Jesus. But I just the spirit, like Judy said, he takes up a bow in our heart. I love that because uh, that's what the Bible teaches. The spirit also reveals God to us. And this is why it's important that we think about this Holy Spirit in the Bible together. And uh, this verse that I quote often, because it's an important one, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God. That's a word that the Apostle Paul made up for this verse. Okay, He combined two words together. God breathed, and he stuck them together. And again, remember, breathe is it's the same word, the same root that we would use for spirit. So all scripture is breathed out by God. It is spirated, inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be equipped, complete, equipped for every good work. So he talks about this, and, and, and Peter talks about this spirit's role as well in 1 Peter one, he says that the Spirit of God spoke through the prophets about the Messiah who was to come. And Second Peter chapter 1 mentions that. It's interesting. Peter said, I want you to think about this for a second. Peter says that he, he talks about the transfiguration where God, you know, Jesus is revealed in his glory before Peter and James and John. And they hear the voice of the Father that says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him, in whom I am well pleased. And and Peter says, but we have something even more sure than that. We've witnessed God speak on the mountain and Jesus in his glory. And we have something even more certain, the trustworthy word as taught. Maybe I should read it because it's better. My recollection is not as good as the, as the thing there. Uh, For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him from the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, but... For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So it comes to inspiration of the Bible. Now, this is one of the things we believe about the Bible, that the Bible, just like Jesus, is fully God and fully human. Namely that we, we are reading, when we read the letters from Paul or one of the Gospels or a psalm that David composed, we are reading a human composition. Right? There, there was 100% of the Apostle Paul's DNA in the letter to the Romans. There's 100% of David's DNA in Psalm 51. However, it's also 100% of the Holy Spirit speaking. It's not as if you know, they were just possessed and became a mouthpiece for God. 
but God worked through them because they were carried by the Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so again, I, I think that this is important because it comes down to, are the Holy Spirit and the Bible ever out of sync? Remember how earlier I said one of the main ways we might think about the Spirit in our day-to-day -day life is, I feel the Spirit leading me to do something. Well, I hear people say that sometimes, and then the, you know, fill in the blank after what he's leading them to do is sometimes something the Bible would consider sinful, right? And it's it's something, it's, it's, it is the cop-out of all cop-outs, because you can always say, I felt the Spirit leading me to do this thing, and that's kind of your excuse to do this. I was, you all know I do ACT tutoring, right? And, uh, you know, I... I was emailing with a mom one time and, and I could tell her son was struggling a little bit. He was getting a little overwhelmed with his other classes and you know, I, he, he wasn't really ready to take the ACT yet. And, and you know, she could have told me he's overwhelmed. We need to stop tutoring. But she said, you know, we really prayed about it and we think the spirit's leading us to, you know, stop tutoring, which, you know, I'm a Christian. So I, I believe <laughs> I'm not blaming them for that conclusion. But it's like, you could just tell me like, he's not ready for tutoring. We need to stop. You don't need to use this as an excuse. But, but again, I've, I've heard it, you know, gross things. The Spirit, you know, I, I just feel like God is releasing me and freeing me to divorce my spouse and go pursue someone else. Was there infidelity involved? Well, no, but but I, I just really feel like God wouldn't lead me to have feelings for this person if, uh, you know, uh, why, why are you living together? You know, you're not married. Well, you know, we prayed about it. We feel like the Spirit's given us an okay on this one. What, what about, like, thou shalt not commit adultery? You know, like, you know, does that cross your rubric anyway? It just, we, if the Spirit is ever leading us in, if, 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 if people say they're being led by the Spirit and it's leading them into something the Bible says is wrong or that is contrary to what the Bible says, well, that's not of the Spirit. You know, the Bible warns us about evil spirits that will try to deceive us. In Galatians chapter 1, even Satan masquerades as an angel of light. So that's where I want us to really think about the inspiration of the Bible. One, it is God's word to us. We can't just, I don't, I don't really like this one. I'm going to step outside, you know, get out from underneath it. That's not, that's not our, our role. But our spiritual life will always be in accordance with God's word. Okay? Uh, so that's one thing. The second is, uh, so spirit and scripture. And finally, let's talk about the spirit in the church. Now, I could have, I could have written 15 pages on this. But uh, didn't have time for that, and we gotta we have to be concise. So I've con I've con I've condensed this to a couple of topics, some of which we've talked about before, some of which we have not. Uh, but I think these are all key things, key elements that if I'm looking for the Holy Spirit's presence in a person or in a church, I'm going to look for this. The first is the fruit of the Spirit. Now we spent last summer, yeah, last summer we talked about this in early fall. Uh, what is the fruit of the Spirit like? It is fruit that the Spirit gives. We are, these are not simply virtues that we work to attain. It is something that once we believe in Jesus Christ, if he's changed us, if the Spirit has given us new life, then he is going to bear this fruit in our lives. Now, it, are, it is something that we can cultivate, but we realize that we receive it from God because these are attributes of God. Okay, so that's the fruit of the Spirit, uh, Galatians 5.22. The second is that this Holy Spirit gives gifts to the churches, to, to, to individual Christians for the building up of the body of Christ. That's what the language that 1 Corinthians 12 says. And the gifts vary, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to draw a distinction that I don't know if I totally believe, but I think it is helpful and people use it a lot. So between some maybe we might call miraculous gift, that is gifts of healing, speaking in prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, performing miracles, and gifts of service, which we read about in, in Romans chapter 12 and Ephesians 4. Gifts of administration, of helping, of leadership, of teaching, generosity, and faith. Now, there are some Christians who believe that the quote-unquote miraculous gifts are done, that we don't experience those in our life anymore. And, and, and the rationale goes something like this. They were essential in the spread of the gospel in the early church. But once the gospel has gone into an area, and that pioneer period, you might say, is over, they're not as necessary. And so they, some people might say, in pioneering context today, we still experience those. You know, you might see those active. So, uh, And that's and that one reason why you, they may not see them as active in their local church. right? Baptists 
Some people say that's the Baptist position. That's not true, but it, there are a lot of Baptists who hold that position. And there are others who believe that the spiritual gifts continue and that, no, we should experience this. And, and the reason we don't experience, like, the, that other explanation is more of an excuse for why we don't experience it now, a rationalization for not experiencing it, because it takes faith to experience those. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm more partial to that view. Uh, I have friends in, who are Pentecostal, and in Pentecostalism is a, is a very diverse movement, so I don't want to pigeonhole it as one thing, or the Church of God movement, you know. Uh, but, you know, they believe in gifts. They believe, some people believe they have gifts of healing, and I, even though I might not have ever witnessed that, so to speak, I don't want to deny that it doesn't happen, or deny that it happens. And again, part of it is I don't see a rationale in the Bible for why certain gifts cease. Some people look at 1 Corinthians 13, uh, where in the middle of this discussion on spiritual gifts, Paul talks about a time when gifts will cease. We won't need the gift of prophecy or knowledge or anything anymore. And so people think, again, that era is, is the, that it's an era kind of thing. Again, my interpretation of that is that on the day of the Lord Jesus returns, we won't need our gifts anymore because we'll be with him. Uh, so, again, there, there are different perspectives there. I don't mind sharing with you my perspective. We could do a deeper dive on that in the future. I, um, I've, I've listed a couple resources here for that. Um, one of them is Sam Storms, who is a pastor in Oklahoma. Just a fun fact, Joy Fox's son, Charlie, is a member at his church in Bridgewater, Oklahoma. And... Uh, Again, but he's written, he's got little books on this topic. He's got big books on this topic. I refer a little book on the topic because it's a lot. Um, but then, and I also listed a, a resource by Tom Schreiner, who is a professor emeritus at, Southern Baptist, at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, a great, prolific New Testament scholar. Uh, and he wrote a book a couple of years ago on this that um, Brogdon and Holman published. Uh, and so uh, if you're interested in that discussion, you can continue uh, down those uh you can pursue that avenue further. Uh, and then finally, the, the final kind of mark I want us to talk about is just the, what does the Spirit do? The Spirit brings unity. The Spirit brings unity. Now, part of it is, I think that the fruit of the Spirit leads to this, and I think that the gifts of the Spirit are building to this. Remember, we are given spiritual gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. They're not to be, again, to think about the situation in the Corinth, a church that is divided by everything. Even spiritual gifts, they would rather use to masquerade their own kind of greatness rather than realize, no, God gave you that gift to edify the church. And, um, but it, Jesus promised his disciples the Holy Spirit in John 8. And again, uh, Judy, I asked you to read John 17 on Sunday. I'm going to read a little bit of John 17 now. The one right across from Matthew 16. Well, it, it's, it's all John 14, 15, and 16. All that. Each of those chapters has a reference to the gift of the Counselor, the Holy Spirit. This, the Greek word is the paraclete. You might have heard people say that before. And that can be translated a lot of different ways. But I think counselor, not in the sense of like, um, I, I need counseling, I need to go to counselor, but like, um, you know, I need, I need counsel, like legal counsel, or, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a, uh, you know, I, I, I need many counselors type of thing. I need a lot of people to help me and guide me. But, uh, John chapter 17, verses 20 to 22, he says, Jesus is praying to God the Father for his disciples, and he says this, I don't pray only for these, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be in us, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. The glory that you've given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I think this is a unity that's referred to, again, the Father and the Son and the Spirit. They're totally unified. You can't, you can't get away from one without getting into the other, right? You can't, it's kind of like the colors of a rainbow. Right? If you look at a rainbow, you see distinct colors, but like, where does the color actually shift? You know, from violet to indigo, indigo to blue, blue to green, green to yellow, yellow to orange, orange to red. There's not a line, you know, we draw lines on our colored sheets that the kids draw, but there's not a line there. It's the same with the persons of the Trinity, but there's a unity that we are aspired to, and I think it's a unity that the Spirit gives. So here's, again, I talked about, like, how do we know the Spirit's moving in a place? 
I put church unity as one of the number one things there. Is a local congregation united? Not just in that they all agree that we're going in the same direction. That's more of a mission vision thing that is corporate language. But are we really united and do we cohere together? Do we rally around each other? Do we hold on to each other? Or do we backbite, tattle, squabble, disagree, quarrel? I think th those are always temptations. And again, I don't think it's a happenstance that those occur in so many letters in the New Testament. I don't think it's just good moral advice. I think it's that's just really, those are important things to a community of people. But is there unity there? If there's not unity there, it's I don't really care about how many of those other subjective feelings that you're experiencing because you're denying a, a, a work of the Spirit. So I think that's important on the local congregational level. I think that's important here. I think it's important in other local congregations. But I also think we should aspire towards unity beyond just uh, whoever's in the room, whoever's on the membership roll, whoever's here with us. I think it's something that we should aspire to with other churches and even across denominations. Now, there's there sometimes becomes a point where you water everything down so much that you're really wondering, what are you holding on to? That's, uh, as my uh, former dean in seminary said, that's the ecumenism of accommodation. He said, rather than an ecumenism of the trenches, it's rooted in this, in the Apostles' Creed. Right? I, one of the reasons I went to an interdenominational seminary was that I could learn from Presbyterians and Lutherans and Anglicans and uh, Methodists and, uh, and Baptists, uh, by the way. But, but it's because we're all united on this. Right? It, if people don't affirm this or they're wishy-washy on this, then I'm not as interested in talking to them. If I can, but if I can lock arms with people who affirm the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, the early teaching of the church, right, and, and what the church has affirmed throughout the ages, then I'm eager to rock and roll. Right? And we might disagree on certain things, and these should be trivialized. We might disagree on who should be baptized. Right? Where does faith happen? Does faith happen when you profess, or does, can faith happen as, and then, again, like, that might be a distinction that you don't understand. What do you mean? There are people who believe that. So, do, do, you know, where does it happen, but that we're united on who Jesus is, what Jesus did, who God is, revealed as Father, Son, and Spirit to us. And again, I think the Spirit compels us to try, to try. And this is important because sometimes Baptists really don't want to try. <laughs> right, back, one of the Baptist insights, and I, I need to wrap up, is that we as a congregational church exist as a body of Christ here. And sometimes that can be a, you know, doesn't matter what else is going on out there, we're going to be us, and we don't need to care about other churches. And I think that's actually a, a weakness, uh, can be a significant weakness that Baptists have. All right, Baptists are sometimes the ones who don't want to play whenever there are ecumenical conversations. That means other Christian denominations get together and talk. Sometimes the Baptists sit in the corner while everyone else is playing because we want to do our thing. I think I think we have to resist that impulse. I think it's more that way in the past than it is now. I think you're right. I think you're right. Again, and I think it's sometimes it's because we don't. I think it's sometimes because we we water. It's easy to water things down. I just want to make sure we don't do that. But I think you are right. I think you are right. Um, so I just think that that's that, that's why when I'm when I'm you might even you know uh, I have been so bold as to quote the Pope in a sermon before. It's not because I submit to the authority of the Pope, like Roman Catholics do, because I think he says something really good and true and helpful. That's that's the reason why, right? And that, that it doesn't contradict what we believe about the Bible. I think that can, can strengthen us and help us. And I try to do that when I'm when I'm studying and preaching is to learn from people who are from a variety of traditions, including Baptists. Because I think we're stronger together. Uh, it's uh, uh, what, what um, the there's a retired theologian named Richard Mao. He's not a Baptist, but he wrote a book and basically he said, you know, I think there's a way in which each denomination kind of strengthens the body of Christ. And for Baptists, it was the the impulse that every person has an individual responsibility to believe before God. And so whether that's a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a Methodist who are baptized as babies and confirmed when they turn 12 and just kind of live in the church, but it still is important that they know that they have to believe before God. They can't just ride on the fact that they had water sprinkled on them and that you know they were in, their name was on a roll whenever they were young. No, you have to believe. But we can learn from other people, right, that, you know, from Presbyterians, that theology is important and we need to spend time. We, we don't need to discount that. From Lutherans, that we need to prioritize the gospel in our proclamation 
Right? If our first foot forward into the world is morality, well, then we're, we've not given them the gospel. We've given them the law. We need to, we need to be gospel people first. We learn from Methodists that sometimes there are methods that we can follow that help us in our evangelism, right? Methodists are the ones who send out the circuit riders. It's a very helpful innovation that we can learn from. Uh, so again, we, we, we all occupy different houses in the tradition, the great household of God, if we're willing to learn from others. So as a personal passion of mine, uh, you see I wrote a paragraph on that, but I spoke on that for 10 minutes. So uh, you can tell, uh, you know, I'll get off my soapbox. But I, I don't think it's just mine. I think that it's something that Jesus cares about. Um, <clears throat> so we should care about it. So don't, don't ever apologize for taking more time for the Bible. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh man. Okay. Well, thanks for. Well, let me say a, a word of prayer. And we'll we'll close. Heavenly Father, thank you for this chance to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ to to just spend time meditating upon your gift to us, the Holy Spirit. How sweet uh, to spend time meditating on you, but even to think about how the Holy Spirit <laughs> is applied to our lives. We pray that He would help us to walk in holiness and in love towards one another and to you. Lord God, preserve us and keep us this week and bring us back together again. We pray in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen.